Hey guys, good morning. Today I'd like to review a very common type of collision problem, which involves shooting a ballistic pendulum and then calculating the initial velocity of the bullet. This version here is perhaps the most challenging of that type of problem due to the conditions involved. Let's start by drawing a hanging block and then we'll set the Y value of where the cord connects to it equal to zero. Once we shoot the bullet, a completely inelastic collision will occur, and the bullet will become stuck inside. As a result, both objects will swing upwards, like this. While everything is still in motion, we're given the tension in the cord once this combined object swings to a height of 0 0.8 meters. To complete this, we'll have to use every single concept I've covered so far in order to get that bullet's initial velocity. This problem is also a really good example that demonstrates the limitations of our conservation laws. We'll begin the process by breaking this up into two stages. We'll call the initial collision stage one. And then once the swinging motion happens, that will be stage two. We do this because each stage has different conserved quantities, and we need to know what those are. Let's figure them out starting with stage one. Our first quantity will be energy. Is that conserved in stage one? The answer is no, it isn't, and here's why. The conservation of mechanical energy only occurs when there's conservative forces doing work on the system. Let's investigate this a bit further. Here's a picture of stage one again. At the exact moment, the bullet enters the block. In the Y direction, we have the weight of both objects acting downwards and the tension acting in the opposite direction. The collision happens so quickly that the block is not displaced in either direction. So these two forces will cancel each other out and there's no net force in the Y direction doing work, conservative or otherwise. In the X direction, we have the contact force of the bullet pushing on the block acting to the right. And by Newton's third law, there's an equal and opposite contact force from the block pushing back on the bullet, acting to the left. So those cancel each other out as well. And we have no net force in the X direction doing work either. So the question is, what non-conservative force is doing work here that's preventing us from conserving mechanical energy? The answer is that it's an internal force of kinetic friction that happens during the collision. We say that some of the bullet's kinetic energy is converted into other types of energy. What are those other types? Well, a major one is acoustic energy, which is responsible for the sound of the collision. There's also thermal energy that's produced by that friction interaction, which will raise the temperature of the block. Additionally, some amount of energy is required to exert enough strain on the block to deform it and allow the bullet to become lodged inside. We can call that deformation energy. So all of this is the reasoning behind why the conservation of energy does not apply in stage one when the completely inelastic collision happens. What about momentum? Thankfully, yes, that is conserved. And here's why. Whenever the vector sum of external forces is zero, then momentum will be conserved. Notice the emphasis on external. If you have a vector sum of zero in just a single direction, well, that's totally okay too. In that situation, the momentum 
will be conserved only in that direction. When we looked at the picture earlier and reviewed all the forces, we saw everything canceling out to zero in X and Y. So momentum would be conserved in both directions there. That covers everything conserved in stage one. In stage two, we have the opposite situation going on. Energy is conserved there. And the reason is that the only force doing work in that stage is the force due to gravity, the weight. And that force is always conservative. Gravity does the same amount of work on an object regardless of the path taken. All that matters is the endpoints. You might wonder though, doesn't the tension do any work? It actually doesn't because the tension acts in the direction perpendicular to the swinging motion. Remember that the definition of work has a dot product in it. And if you're taking the dot product of a force that's 90 degrees separated from the direction of the displacement, your work expression has a cosine of 90 degrees in it, which is zero. So there's some clarity behind the why. What about momentum? Well, you can probably guess this one already. The answer is no, it's not conserved. And the reason is that the vector sum of external forces isn't zero in stage two. And we'll see that once we draw a free body diagram. Since everything is at an angle in stage two, we'll need to get that angle first before we start drawing anything. Let's go back to the picture. There's a right triangle that's hidden here, right there. Let's grab that and ignore the rest of the picture for the time being. We know the lengths of the shorter leg and the length of the hypotenuse, so let's include them and insert our angle here. Recall from trigonometry that the definition of the cosine function is the ratio of the length of the adjacent side to the length of the hypotenuse. So in our situation, we have the cosine of theta being equal to the ratio of 0.8 meters to 1.6 meters. The units of meters will cancel out and 0.8 over 1.6 reduces to 1 half. If we want theta, we can take the cosine inverse of both sides and ask ourselves, what's the smallest positive angle that has a cosine value of 1 half? The angle we're looking for is 60 degrees. Now we can draw our free body diagram of stage two and notice that the axes are now altered to be parallel and perpendicular to the direction of the swinging movement. Regarding our forces, we have the weight of both objects, our conservative force pointing downwards and the tension in the cord points towards positive y. Since the weight doesn't lie along our axes, I'll insert the angle and break that vector up into its cosine and sine components. The tension is larger than the cosine component of the weight, and the sine component isn't canceled out by anything. Thus, there is no vector sum of zero happening here in either direction. One last thing to include will be a centripetal acceleration vector, which also points in the positive y direction. Notice that the swinging motion traces out a portion of a circle, and wherever there's circular motion, there's a centripetal acceleration. With all that finished, we can now do a sum of forces in the y direction and get an expression for the final speed of this object here in stage two. Remember that the definition of centripetal acceleration is V squared divided by R. 
And here, V is represented by the final speed of both objects here in stage two. And the radius of the circle that these objects move in is equal to the full length of the cord, 1.6 meters, which I'm calling capital L. Let's also include the definition of the weight here and exchange W with mg. I'm going to multiply both sides by the length of the cord and then divide both sides by the mass of both objects, like this. If we take the square root, we now have an equation for the final speed in stage two. From this point, we'll need to work our way backwards and get the initial velocity in stage two, then move on to stage one. To do that, we'll take advantage of the energy conservation in stage two. Let's go through this and see what we can eliminate. When stage two begins, the block and the bullet are still at the position of y is equal to zero, which means there's no initial potential energy. There's no other work done during stage two either, since that internal friction we talked about earlier occurs only in stage one. So if we plug in the definitions for what remains, the idea is to solve for V both initial here on the left. Let's start by eliminating the mass from both sides. Next, I'll multiply both sides by two, then plug in our expression for the final velocity in stage two that we got earlier. Since we're taking the square of this, all the terms underneath the square root are now free, at least until we take a square root again, which now puts the entire right-hand side underneath a radical sign. Now we're almost done. There's just one last thing left to do. Let's hold on to this result and come back to it in just a moment. We have to switch gears and investigate the conservation of momentum in stage one now. Here's the individual momenta of both objects on the left and the momentum sum during the exact moment of the collision on the right. Since the block wasn't initially moving, we can eliminate the second term on the left and then simplify everything to this. If we divide both sides by the mass of the bullet, we finally get an equation for its initial velocity. All the quantities on the right are known, and there's no simplification left. So let's plug in our numbers. The whole expression is pretty long, and it barely fits on a slide, so I had to reduce the font size a bit. Hopefully that's not too hard to read. If you enter this very carefully into a calculator, you'll get the same result that I did, an initial velocity of 281 meters per second for the bullet. And that's it. We're done. I hope this helped. Thanks for watching, everyone. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Take care.